I'm delighted to welcome you to today's seminar on ethical issues in organ transplantation. Our speaker today is Dr. Juliana Testa, uh, who is the surgical director um, of Living Donor Liver Transplant at Baylor University Medical Center. Uh, Giuliano uh, received his MD from the University of Padua, uh, as, as you know, one, one of the oldest uh, medical schools uh, in Europe, um, I think dating back 900 years. Uh, 1284. 1284. Uh, and, um, and then uh, his residency was um, here at the University of Chicago, and he had fellowship training in transplantation uh, both at Baylor uh, University and then came back here to work under Dr. Christoph Brolsch uh, and train further in transplantation. Um, uh, Giuliano also did a medical ethics fellowship at the McLean Center a number of years ago. Um, and before joining uh, Baylor, uh, he was the director of living donor liver transplant here, uh, first at the University of Illinois, and then the director of liver transplant and hepatobiliary surgery at the University of Chicago. Uh, in addition to his interest in liver transplantation, uh, Dr. Uh, Testa is also interested in complex liver surgery as well as small bowel transplantation. Um, I say all this as a preface to saying that uh, I've enjoyed my interactions with Giuliano over the years. We've published a couple of, um, how shall I put it, provocative papers together. Uh, no, not outrageous. Yes. Provocative. Oh, uh, so say outrageous. Two say outrageous and the rest say provocative. Uh, I say provocative, but, and we're dear friends. So today, Giuliano is going to talk to us on ethical approaches to living donation, a different perspective. Giuliano. Well, thank you. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Oh. So, uh, I'm very glad to be here. Honored, first of all. I, I look at the roster of the speakers for this uh, series of talks, and uh, of course, I'm really the, the minor uh, son in all of this. Uh, so I'm very honored of being here, and uh, this is the place where I learned to be a surgeon. Uh, this is the place where I came back as an attending. This is the place where I learned to be an ethicist in a formal way. So my heart really goes out to uh, all the friends that I see here today. Uh, thank you for coming, and of course to Mark, to whom I really owe a lot for my career and for my provocative, at least he's a he kind of... Uh, supported some of my provocative ideas and decided to put his name out for it and I, I appreciate that. And we stir up some of the comments from uh, Lenny and Dick and uh, I do appreciate your comments because I think that's really the way that we can move forward a little bit in this, uh, in this thing. This is, uh, I think, no less provocative than uh, the other things I've uh, written in my life. Um, and comes uh, a lot from the training that I had. So it's not something that I'm inventing because I woke up one morning, but I really thought hard of what I learned here as a, a fellow uh, and uh, some of the basic concepts that I try to apply on my daily life uh, as a transplant surgeon. I have no financial interest. My disclaimer is that I do this for a living. And uh, I am with donors and donors' family every day of my life. I run a very busy living donor program. Uh, we have evaluated or have received requests for 180 uh, potential donors since I got to Baylor. So it's, it's, it's a lot of people I talk to, a lot of potential donors. And I think I would be at least be, uh, whenever, you know, if you disagree, at least take uh, my side when you think that I live with this. Uh, patients and I understand their needs and I try to then fashion that in, in a sum of uh, format that can be discussed in a convivium like this. Um, of course we have to start saying this is I think is the, the one before the last uh, talk of your series uh, why this has been such a hot topic uh, the, 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 the transplant in general and then I will go on on revisiting and I hope uh, convincing you that it's time to move forward from the concept of, of the poise uh, and looking at that from the disease and living donor point of view. And then uh, we, are, we have to discuss about risk because every time we discuss about uh, living donation, the first thing that comes to mind to everybody is risk. 
Uh, there, is no, there is no way out of it. And so I want to really address this in a, in a, I hope, at least from my point of view, the right way. And then I want to really stress on the benefits that, in my opinion, they're not well addressed uh, when we discuss living donation of living donation itself. And then what I believe should be done or could be done to make it a little more uh, possible. Now, this is uh, something that they teach you at the business school in macroeconomics. That's the basic of what we do in life. It's a supply and demand curve, and uh, everything goes down from here, in few words. If we had enough organs, we won't be having this transplant ethics series. That's a, that's a fact, it's a statement. We don't, and so the interest goes up. And of course, the smaller the supply, the greater is the ethical debate. And we all see all these ethical debates regarding uh, donors being this disease or living donors. Uh, there is a public interest, uh, of course. There is a great financial impact. This is a many money uh, making business. And ignoring it is just uh, trying to see life from a very nice heavenly place that it is not. And so we have to recognize that. Uh, and there are too many proposed solutions. In surgery, we say if there are 10,000 ways to fix a, something from a surgical point of view, that means that we haven't found the right one. And that's why we have all these discussions. And then there is a lot of patient suffering attached to it, and we can't discount that either. Um, one example that I want to just to set up the pace is, of course, the one that um, once there is a shortage, then we have to put a limitation to what we do because otherwise we wouldn't have that. Um, and usually what we say, we exclude some of the indication to transplantation because we're using a public good. And if you think about what the public good at the end is, is a balance between utility and justice. And I'm not saying that the system is fair, the system is not fair by any means, but tries to be just, and it's a utilitarian justice that is used when we allocate organs to people. Um, and this creates a tension in me as a transplant surgeon because I know they have to make choices, and sometimes they're not easy choices when we make decisions about to whom give it care and to whom not to give care. And I believe that if we had not an oversupply, but maybe an even supply, many of these discussions would not occur because it's very simple. We just took away one of the variables in the conversation. Um, there is a tension between also the family and the expectation they have for care and what we believe care should be, and it's a big tension. And to give an example, I mean, nobody in this hospital will ever have a problem in offering a Whipple to an 80-year-old. We do not. When I was here, uh, my good friend uh, uh, did a Whipple on uh, somebody who was 91 year old. Nobody said that's already beyond the life expectancy. So, th but there is no question. We, we, if the patient survives as well, it's fine. On the other end, you can have a 40-year-old with a hepatosoral carcinoma. It's beyond the criteria that we accept. And at that point, we will say, no, you cannot have the, the, the treatment. But I, I assume, I would like to think that if we had enough levers for everybody, this would be something that we probably do. I mean, that's an assumption, but that's the way I think about it. And there is also a tension between uh, what we value in terms of outcome and what the patients uh, have in terms of their idea of outcome. For me as a physician, I need to provide a five-year survival a certain number of years when I can say that my therapy is helpful to somebody or, or whatever, it's, uh, it's acceptable, let's put it this way. But for the patients, the two years of life are, are much different. I had a patient who was 30 year old and had a bad cancer in his liver, he told me, I wanna have a transplant because even if you tell me that my survival is 30% in two years, I go for it. And if anybody has read this book, uh, uh, Think Fast and Slow by Kahneman, who is a former Nobel Prize, he tells you that people tend to discount certain things. So when we play lotto, for example, we play lotto and we don't know that we'll never win. It's one out of uh, how many millions that win. So we always think at risk and, and life in a different, uh, under different parameters. But as a physician, as an ethicist, you need to think about this. You need to think how your patients uh, value their survival, what is really for them important, instead of looking at the problem from our kind of you know, high position of professional educated people. So as you remember, I guess the fellow are more on this side, I was on your side a few years ago. Uh, this is a very big concept in ethics, in medical ethics, and just to make it easy, is uh, uh, when you introduce a new therapy, uh, the, the concept should be that the new therapy should be at least as good uh, or better of the one that was there before to treat the same disease. 
And I think it makes absolute sense. Uh, and so if they need to be uh, ethically acceptable, at least they should uh, fulfill this, um, uh, this role. In uh, 1989, uh, Mark and um, uh, my, my mentor, uh, Broch, uh, wrote this paper uh, introducing the concept of living donor uh, liver transplantation for kids. And uh, you probably, uh, as a fellow, you read the paper or you were exposed to the paper. And uh, it's interesting because there was a, a sequela to this paper that came in about 2001 or two, and was still uh, Mark and David Cronin that wrote about uh, the concept evolving because we're going from the kids to the adults, and so we're increasing the risk. And then the, this double equipoise came about by which you have to also to take in consideration what happens to the donor and not only to the recipient. So it's not only that the therapy needs to be acceptable in terms of clinical outcome for the recipient, but also that you need to be sure that in the process the donor doesn't get aimed or uh, injured. Um, so what do we do? And that's really where I start thinking a little bit. Uh, when the new treatment uh, proves to be superior to the old one. Uh, shouldn't we then embrace the old one because we prove that that treatment is the, is the better treatment? Uh, but in order to do that, we have to do a little bit of homework before we say, okay, living donor is a better treatment. Uh, we have to, uh, before we get there, we have to do some kind of a stepwise uh, approach. Um, so I would ask, are the outcomes better in living donation in comparison with a diseased donor? That's the number one question that was raised by uh, the 1989 paper. We didn't know that when, because the paper was written before the first living donor pediatric transplant was done in the University of Chicago. And then are the donors uh, suffering a major complication being aimed or whatever during the process of being donors? Those are the two major questions that we want to address. Um, let's talk about outcome. I dare to say that there is no question about it. And uh, if you need a kidney transplant, you want to have a living donor kidney transplant. That's period end of discussion. You can discuss as much as you want, but if you look at the numbers, those are numbers. I didn't invent this. I didn't alter the, 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 the slide. This is directly out of this SRTR data. So that, for who is not familiar with that, the scientific registry of transplant um, is a registry where all the data of transplantation go in. So it's national, you can uh, log in your computer and pull the data out. And so there is, there is no, there is no I, I'm not even going to spend too much time commenting this thing. The therapy is better from this point of view. Then, of course, you can do something else. Same registry, this is the SRTR, and uh, this is the unadjusted patient in graph survival. This is living donor livers, this is uh, uh, disease livers, the therapy is not only is the same, but it's better. And if you wait long enough, I'm going to show you, uh, as it's happened for kids, that there is a significant difference in long-term survival. It's just a matter of getting there, because we went over the learning curve. I can speak for it, because I was one the one that started this operation without knowing how to do it. And so now that we know how to do it, I can speak for it. So again, uh, patient survival by organ, you can look at living donor kidneys and disease and living donor. And again, graph survival, same thing. So bottom line is that the question to be asked, are transplant outcomes with living donor graph superior to disease? I think that the answer is very clear. There is no doubt that they are either the same or in the case especially of kidney for the time being, and I think it will be for livers as well, definitely superior to uh, disease uh, transplant. Now, we're, now we start going into the nitty gritty of the issues, the risk, the harm to the donor. This is where really always we end up uh, discussing sometimes very uh, passionately in a certain way. I'm very passionate about this, of course, uh, about the risk. Now, this is still the same uh, stuff. Uh, those are percent of patients uh, we have a complication reported, uh, six months, 12 months, the type of complication, bleeding, uh, wound infection, bowel obstruction, vascular complication, readmission to the hospital, this is per thousand, and uh, other complications. So those are public data. You may question them, you may say that they're not real data, they may, they're reporting, but this is what we have. 
So I'm not inventing anything. This is what we got. But then the real issue is that all the complication, more or less, can be treated. What cannot be treated is when people die in the process of donation. That's the ultimate complication, unfortunately. So I want to focus a little bit on this because I think that's very important. And also because of my experience, and I want to talk from my experience, as a transplant surgeon involved in kidney, liver, and intestinal living donor transplant, is that the way I see a complication is totally different than my donors perceive the complication, which is an important issue. And I go back to how we perceive our profession, the way we deliver care, and how the, the person who receives the care perceives what we do and how they perceive to be patients. So this is still the same. What I did, um, those are the causes of death. Uh, uh, within 30 days of donation, within three months, within a year, between one and two years after donation. And I, here I stop. And I stop because we need to be logical sometime. Okay? If I want to draw a correlation between the donation act and death, I need to put a stop somewhere. Because if grandma died 15 years after the donation, I'm sorry, grandma had to die. So I, and I probably I'm a little harsh on this, but we need to really look at the data the way they are. <laughs> and then I decided that for the sake of it, just because otherwise the number become too big, I started from 2007 and went to 2011. And so I said, this is my analysis. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just reading the data. And then anybody can, is willing to go there and read the data again and do an analysis, fine. But today I'm here, I'm talking, so I have the privilege of saying what I believe is, in my opinion, right. So I go over it. <laughs> so between 2007 and 2011, there were 32 deaths in 27,850 people. Now, if you wanted to discount this, fine, go ahead and do it. I'm not discounting it, I'm accepting it, I'm writing it. So if you do perfect mathematics, it's 0.1%. This is two years? Two, this is within two years from the donation on a cohort of uh, 2,700 uh, patients and uh, uh, in uh, this time period. I arbitrarily take it, but you can go back and forth. I'm checking the numbers, more or less. This is for the sake of, the, of, the, of our conversation. So. 32 deaths within two years from donation, 12 are medical. It's not told to me, and the data don't say you, what kind of medical issues. I know that's a medical problem, all right? Eight are suicides. Six are accident homicides. Four are malignancy, and two are unknown. That's what the, the data say. Now, I learned on my own skin that correlation is not causation, right? And this is my number one criticism to most of the papers that have been written on living donation thus far, even on the one delivery. You go and read the paper on the living donor liver transplant death. There are deaths there that have nothing to do with living donation, but they're there and they count when people want to make an argument against it. I want to level the field. Let's talk about the same things all together and then discuss whether it's right or wrong. So, 10 deaths, 6 deaths from accident, homicide, there are 4 to malignancy that cannot have anything to do with donation. I'm sorry. If I donated and I crossed the street and I got hit by a bus, what does that have to do with a donation? Logically, it doesn't hold any water. If I die two years later of a breast cancer, I'm sorry. It's not, it's got nothing to do with donation. And this is, this is, this is medically, it makes no sense. Ain't that to suicide. Now, this is important. My colleagues who are against living donation will tell you that those people died because of the donation. I'm not saying that's not true. I'm just saying that I have the same right of saying they probably they did not. Because they have the same data I have. So unless I can prove that they had some major mental malaise when they were evaluated for donation and then they died, I have the same arguments to tell them that this correlation doesn't hold any water unless it's proven to me. I see the records of these people. So I'm not discounting this, I'm just telling you why it should be only one way. Why cannot we see also the other side of it? So maybe that there was the tipping point. I'm not saying it was not, but I have no proof to say there was. The, maybe two years later, somebody got in a major depression and decided to commit suicide. But the donation was two years earlier. What is the correlation there? I fail to see that. So my assumption is that all medical deaths within a year from donation are related to donation. I give you that. If somebody dies of medical reason, one year after donation has got to have something to do with it. I mean, at least I would think so. Or at least I would say that there must be some relation to donation, and more likely 
there was something at the time of devaluation that was not picked up properly and made these people die afterwards. So go back to that. Is something bad for living donor? No, it means only that whoever did the workup for the donor was not a good physician, was not a good transplant surgeon, was not a good transplant pathology, was not a good transplant nephrologist, and means totally something should have been picked up. Okay, but that doesn't mean the liver donation is bad in itself. It means that we have to look at the causes of what happened. So my conclusion to the response to harm is that most of the 12 medical deaths after donation should be considered preventable death, I think because maybe there was something that was not picked up. The 30 days report, they think, cannot be attributed to the donation with uh, certainty, because that's what I, what I see. And so if you redo the numbers, the death is 0.05%. Do we want to talk with numbers? Let's talk about real numbers. Those are real numbers. OK? So that's what I have to say. I'm not discounting. I'm just giving you my analysis of the data. They are publicly known to everybody and to whom Everybody, we, we have to contribute the data. I don't lie when, when my donors have a complication. So if the question that we had in the beginning, as you remember, was uh, outcome and harm, I would say, yes, it's true. The donor may be harmed in the process of donation. I'm now saying it's not true. It's unfortunate, absolutely true. It's a reality. Now, what do we have? If we agree upon the transplant is the accepted treatment for stage, uh, end stage organ disease, I think it is unless we find some magical thing or we do a lot of preventive medicine, when we get to end organ uh, failure, transplant is the treatment for it. And there's a fact that there is no enough organs and they're not growing. Now, this is another big thing, and I want to go into this a little bit. When I say it's not growing, I think I say the truth. Because, bottom line, we're not going anywhere. And despite all the campaigns we have had, the, what the campaigns have brought about is increasing minimally the number of donors available and mainly in a category where you really don't really like to have a donor. So we are increasing the amount, but we are not for sure increasing the quality. And by the way, to the one who heard, oh, we have this new machine that can pump the kidneys, remember one thing for somebody who pumps every kidney is the transplant. The pumps doesn't make a kidney better. The pump, what it does, rules in or out the kidneys that need to be transplanted. So overall, it's not like a bad kidney all of a sudden will become a good kidney when you put in the pump. A bad remains a bad kidney. It just ruled out for transplantation so we can do a better service to our patient. We don't give them a lemon. That's the way it works. So it is a fact that living donation can increase the number of patients receiving treatment. I think it's a fact. Uh, Mark one time had a beautiful slide where he said that if we had enough living donors, we had, remember the slide that went all over, the, over the thing, because it's a, theoretically an unlimited source of organs. That's what it is. And uh, it is a fact that it's got superior outcomes. Say whatever you want. If I, if I need a, a, a transplant, I want to have a living donor, honestly. So a new interpretation of the concept, not the new, but the, at, at least a, a, an evolution of the concept of the equipoise should be that we should support and promote living donation because the new therapy, the introduction of living donation, is better than disease transplant. But the double equipoise puts in, 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 the, in the game the donor. That's important. And so the question is, do the data shown suggest that living donation should not be performed? Because that's really where we have to go. Is this the data suggest that we shouldn't be from the data? Let's go back. So if we accept that living donation significantly contributes to the reestablishment of health in thousands of patients and could potentially solve the supply and demand impasse where we are, no matter what people say, look at the number, study the number, then the risk to the non or well-being is the factor that makes people pause and wonder. As a matter of fact, most of my colleagues who speak about transplantation living donor, the first slides they put up is the risk to the donor. So it's risk in reality where we focus our attention. It's risk that we want to discuss properly. So is risk zero the only amount of risk that would make living donation acceptable to you all? Answer your question for yourself. Risk zero, risk zero, no risk whatsoever. If the risk of zero is the fact, would you say that everything is, uh, is nice and clean, we should do living donation everybody? The only thing he's going to come up with is an incision in his belly uh, where, where the organ came out. That's all. No risk associated with it. And probably uh, David Song can find a way of fixing that incision in a way that is not even visible. So life goes back, back to normal. 
is risk what we are discussing about. So I can tell you that if risk zero is the condition sine qua non, which, okay, okay, so is the condition by which either we apply to that or not, and otherwise we say no, I can tell you that we should abandon today. No question asked, leaving donation. If that's what we want, because bottom line, well, there is no risk zero in donation, and there is no risk zero in anything that has to do with medicine. That's the reality. Now, if risk is zero, well, no, risk zero, we, okay, we, we accept it's not going to be zero. What is an amount of risk that we would be able to accept? Is there a, a, an amount of risk in this room, all of us, that we are interested in this issue will be, will be acceptable? I do not know. But I can tell you that my impression as a physician who lives with this every day of his life is that we are the way we are because we kind of accept that this is the risk we are comfortable with. And the reason why I say that, because if this wasn't the case, we would be already said no, the doctors. I myself would already say no. And I'm somebody that lost a donor when I was in Germany. First case of donor death for an adult in Europe was in the hospital where I work. I was both in the donors, in the recipient, in the donor when he went back to have a transplant that never was completed, in the recipient who needed to have a new liver because the one that the father donated to him uh, failed. So I have that experience. I can talk from that experience. And I was here, and Dick, uh, Dr. Thiessen was with me in the OR when I had a major complication of why my donor. So I think I can speak with a little bit of uh, at least the feelings about what happens in that situation. But anyway, I think that the government or the doctor would already say, no, this is unacceptable. We are not going to do living donation any longer. But we are, not, we are doing it. So I, it seems to be that we are kind of navigating in the water where we were more or less comfortable. So. The conclusion, at least that I draw from this risk analysis, is that if any amount of risk is too high, living donation must be abandoned. What the consequence of abandoning living donation, if we did that, then we have to leave the consequences. Five years, 27,870 uh, kidneys less, which means that 30,000 30, more or less patients more on the transplant list with the same amount of cadaver donors available. We can do it. I'm just saying there is a consequence. There's a, a, price, to, a price to pay. There is a price to pay for anything that we do in our life and in medicine and uh, delivering care as well. Um, and then if the certain amount of risk is acceptable, then we should continue to use living donors as a good source of organ. <coughs> so let me go back and you know, give back a little bit of a summary of what we've discussed thus far. Uh, it is agreed that transplant is the accepted treatment for end-stage organ failure. Agreed upon? I guess yes. It is a fact there are not enough organs. You may say, yeah, but if we're increasing by 200 a year, but bottom line, go and look. I think it's agreed. It is a fact I show to you that uh, living donors are a good source, and, and they are practically uh, a limited number of source. It is clear that it's better. And if we look from a simple ethical point of view, I think I've shown to you that according to what this place has made real for everybody interested in ethics in living donation or transplant at large that the double equipoise is fulfilled. So we are ethically sound when we accept living donation as a potential therapy for our patients. But strange enough, despite all this, the number of living donors is not growing at all. If anything, it's decreasing. Don't believe that? This is it. This is up to 2011. So the deceased donor transplant, uh, they are up by a few hundred. But the living donor transplant, uh, they keep coming down. And if you don't believe that, this is uh, Rodriguez. He gave me these slides. He presented at the ELPAT meeting, uh, the ethics meeting in Rotterdam last week. And I love these slides. This is up to 2004. He made the slides. He just put the, plotted the data. And then this is what's, on, what's going on. So there is a decline in the number of living donor uh, transplant performed. That's what it is. 15% decline in the past years. So um, it's clear that there is something wrong here, or there is, there is a different perception about things. And it's clear that the transplant community is not promoting or supporting living donation, despite what I believe are clear benefits. So, uh, and it's clear to me that we have a very strong push to use marginal organs to use anything out there that comes from disease uh, donors. And if you think about medicine, look at the University of Chicago. 
I mean, our logo, I can say our, I mean, I spent uh, years of my life here. Our logo is at the forefront of medicine. You come here, you expect to get the best treatment ever. So if I need a, a coronary artery bypass, and I go to the, the, the cardiac surgeon, and say, oh, you know what, I can do a coronary artery bypass, but I'm gonna do only uh, two vessels instead of three, because if I did three, um, you know, it's, uh, the, it's cost too long time, I can't do it. You, nobody would accept that. You go to somebody that gives you the best treatment possible. When you come to me, you know what I have to tell you? 50% of my kidney transplant from disease are extended criteria donor, which means they are above the age of 50 or 55, and 50%, 50%, 5-0. So, and, uh, and uh, I transplant routinely livers that come from 75 and 80 year old of age. Livers with people who have hepatitis C, hepatitis B. So don't tell me that that's a good quality stuff. I'm not telling even my patients are giving them a good quality. I'm very upfront. I say that's what it is. I have to show them for informed consent curves. We, at Baylor, we have curves that tell the patients the difference between survival between uh, 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 five years between a kidney and extended criteria kidney. And there is a difference. And we have to explain them why. So routinely, we as physicians, they train to give the best treatment, offer instead a minor treatment because, let's go back, of the supply and demand issues and the problem that we have with the kind of therapy we have to give. You don't believe me? That's fine. Again, the data are there. Do you want to have an extended criteria kidney? Be my guest. If you are ready to drop by 50% your survival at 10 years. I'm not inventing that. Those are national data. So that's what we're doing. I'm a little outspoken on this, but I guess you will appreciate this. Um, of course, you can say, well, you got your patient transplanted. What if then your patient has a higher rate of failure? He goes back on the pole, gets another kidney. What if your patient gets a DCD liver? The data from Northwestern 64% of their patients within two years are back on the transplant list. No. Yes, Michael Becassis, I'm sorry, I'm not making up, I got this slide, I didn't put it up here. It's public. So bottom line, guys, this is what we do. So do we have alternatives? That's, the, that, that's very important. Or should we support uh, and promote living donation? I don't know, let's look. I want to kind of ease it up a little bit. And uh, I read this book, which I invite you to read since you're doing your ethics uh, fellowship. It's, uh, it's called The Scarce Goods. And it's an it's a interesting book because it draws an analogy between the William Brown episode and story and the transplant story at large. And um, the book is then written and goes into a location of organs. So it's the, the, the second part of the book is a little bit difficult to read, but I think it's the base uh, by which we will probably soon change the allocation of uh, distribution of a disease organ in the United States because it's a very good book in terms of science behind it. But the William Brown is an interesting story. And uh, the analogy that the writer, uh, Koch is his name, draws about the, the, the William Brown is that this is a ship that goes from Ireland to the United States and brings uh, emigrants. And there was an interest both from the United States uh, of America at that time and uh, Ireland for these people to come here. Because they had nothing in Ireland, and they could find job here, and the United States need jobs. So it was perfect. So there was a business around it, as usual in life. You know, you can't discount the fact that men won't be seen out of anything. And so there were these ships that go uh, from Ireland to the United States, but went to the upper north route. And doing this would save them time, but also was a dangerous route because the icebergs were there. So when you look at the movie Titanic, they hit an imagine with, with those kind of ships. This is a, at the end of the, 17th century, uh, the 18th century that happened this. So bottom line is that they sink. They sink and there are only two lifeboats on the ship. One goes with the captain and, uh, and, uh, and the higher ups in the crew, of course. That was normal at that time. Uh, remember, historically, it was accepted at the time that the captain always, there, it's not true that they sunk with the ship. It would, since the captain was the most educated and the best person on board, he would save his life to try to save everybody's life. That was the concept. So that's one lifeboat is gone. The second lifeboat is probably a piece of junk. 
and the, the lower people in the boat are the, in the crew are in the boat, and then few passengers. And guess what happened to the other passengers? They were let sink with the, with the ship. No question asked. It was accepted at that time. Then something happens which made this go to trial. It was one of the first trials ever made in this history that this little boat could not navigate the rough waters up north in the Atlantic and they decided they were too heavy. So what they do? They throw somebody outboard. Who was out? The passengers. So the crew members saved their life, uh, both the one in the first boat and the second lifeboat, but the passengers all died. So he draws this analogy to show that it took a tragedy for the maritime companies to change their things. And one day, what they did, they increased the number of lifeboats. But interesting enough, you probably missed that the Titanic itself, it was in 19, what, what year was it? 1912, did not have enough lifeboats for everybody. And that's why also so many people died. It was only later that now it's a requirement that the number of lifeboats on a boat needs to be adequate to the number of passengers and crew members and things like that. So it's not that, that late that these things have happened. So they changed that, they, they increased the number of boat, lifeboats, but also they understood that if the business had to continue, they had to change route and offer you know, something better to that. But it took a tragedy and a trial for the first time to get to this, uh, to this uh, thing. And the book is nice because it draws this analogy of supply and demand uh, as in condition of necessity. It was a necessity to bring the people from Ireland, from Europe to the United States and how to navigate in, this, in these conditions. So, talking about this, how do we change the system? How do we do things in order to make sure that we don't have a, a William Brown episode that I think we are within now, but that's a different issue. We can decide that we're going to decrease significantly the number of patients on the list. Are we willing to do that? Be my guest. Try to tell a 70-year-old that he is not allowed any longer to have a kidney transplant. Try to limit the, the entrance, the, 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 to, make, to put gatekeepers to the, to the list even more than we do today. So we have less people. It's interesting, we are about 350 million United States. If you look at the number of people on the transplant list for any single organ in the United States and you do a ratio with the population, we have the highest number of patients listed for transplant than any other country in the world. If you compare that with the number of transplants on the waiting list for kidney or livers in Germany, France, England, Italy, Spain, Korea, you name it, the, the, the difference is significant. So we are listing many, many people, probably with broader indication than anybody else. Try to stop that. I think it's going to be probably impossible. You can continue to develop tools and strategies to recruit more deceased donors. It's fine to me. Again, be my guest. I've been in this business since 1996. And I've seen everything in the contrary to everything to try to increase the number of deceased donors. And now the big thing has been uh, presumed consent. We don't want it. Uh, paying for organs. We don't want it. Uh, use elective patients like <laughs> Mark and I wrote. We don't want it. Uh, so th this, is, this is really what we got. We, we're not really, in, and there are papers out there that I invite you to read. They made a calculation on looking at the demand that we have and what happens if we really have a bigger supply and not even using all the possible cadaver donors in the United States, we will reach the demand so we will be really able to uh, move from the impasse. Or we can wait for something big. When I was a fellow, the big thing was xenotransplantation. I haven't seen it. It's been uh, 20 years. Uh, the next thing is going to be scaffolding. It's going to be using stem cells and build something. And they're moving forward, but i will be retired before we use that. So I'm talking about today. I'm going to find a way of discussing this today, not three years from now, as today as we speak. Because the reality is today, William Brown is today, is not two years from now. So I want a different starting point. And the different starting point needs to start with this assumption. There are more than assumption, are almost facts. Is superior organ quality, living donation, is superior outcomes, is lower cost. I can prove that. My organ bank just increased the fees by 10%, which means that when I go and acquire a liver from them, I pay $4,500 more. So that's what it is. It costs a lot of money. But cost also up front, because the longer you stay in the list, the more you cost. And somebody makes a buck out of it because this is medicine. We don't want to do prevention. 
but we want to continue to keep our patients as long as we can so we can get more revenues from that. You may not like it, but that's the way it is. Um, of course, I want to do transplant because I can wear a spiffy Italian suit, but that's <laughs> different. Um, and there is a potentially infinite supply, which if we use properly could be very, very useful. Um, so how do we better promote living donation? I think you need to complete change the perception and the scope of living donation. That's my, my idea. So what I suggest, first of all, let's stop thinking that everything you t every time you, you talk about living donation, you, s you feel like you're soliciting for organs. Not doing that. I don't, I'm, I, I don't wanna feel like this. I wanna make sure that people understand the living donation is a treatment that's perfectly acceptable, that's out there, and that's the best treatment available for end organ uh, failure. Unless you need a heart, that's a different issue. But for, for the organs that we can transplant for living donors, that's the reality. So I don't wanna feel like soliciting. We should change that perception first. And then let's make donation the first therapy. Because you know, every time you go to talk to a transplant surgeon or a transplant physician who's not like me, you sit down and it will tell you a long story about the disease transplant. Then at the end, they slip in, oh, by the way, there is a living donor available eventually. Maybe, if you want to, but it's risky. No, let's say that when they come to talk to us, we tell them, do you have a living donor? Do you have a living donor? How many family members do you have a living donor? I'm, I don't want to feel guilty about that. I'm not guilty about that because I'm providing excellent care. So I tell them, your best chance is to get a living donor. The rest we'll discuss later. And if you want, there is also a disease option. I'm bold enough to say this. Now, stop questioning donor motivation, discard them if they're not suit the ones accepted by the doctors. We always supply our mind thinking to the patients. Why, don't, wh why do we do that all the time? It's like we are the, 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 the keepers of the truth. We are the keepers of the right things to do. We are the keepers of the way the world should run. And what about the patients? They may have thousand different motivations for wanting to donate. Why are we discarding that? Oh, that, that motivation is really, uh, that there is something iffy about that. I, I don't, I don't want to do that. And you know, it's the same thing with the Good Samaritan. There is another book that I'd like to, to, to read. It's about the Good Samaritan. It's written by um, people that went around and interviewed, I don't know how many Good Samaritans around there. And when you read that, those are real stories. You really understand that they, they're not crazy. These people are not nuts. They want to do something that makes sense in their opinion. Why are we discounting that? Why are we putting that psychiatric evaluation, double psychology evaluation? Are you crazy? I mean, they're not crazy. But that's what we do. Look at, I'm not kidding. You go out and you look at the uh, request for Good Samaritan donation in any of it's, it's It's longer, it's more elaborate, it's more questioning than any other request for limb donation. That's what it is. It's the reality. So, we also to value the fact that the benefit of living donation are not limited to the recipient, but the donor has, rightly so, an invested in terms of recipient and well-being. Why should we discard that? Of course the wife has an interest to be a donor for her man, even if she doesn't love her anymore. What if the guy is a breadwinner in the family? I have an interest that he does well, so he continues to bring bread to the family. What's wrong with that? It's important, guys, because this is all what we do day in and day out when we question these things. We have to redesign the whole donor experience so that risk and complication are explained. But they do not take the center stage in the process. It's a given. I prove it to you. I gave it the numbers. I'm not discounting it. But why should it be the first thing you're moving? It's risky. You're going to die. This is not the right approach. It will never work this way. It doesn't really work. And so if you keep highlighting the complication of something, you're not really giving the right perception out there. You're just doing the wrong thing for what we are trying to promote. And if you don't bring up the positive aspect, this is Janine Elkin is there. She can tell you about 10 stories of donors we had here that had a better life after donation because maybe they, get, they lost weight or they stopped smoking or they didn't do binge drinking. I mean, those are very important things. I, I, that, that's, those are real life stories. Instead of what we do, do, we do highlight the one who had the complication. Well, I'm not discounting that, but that's the minority. 
That's the biggest minority that I've ever seen in my and no industry will run with that. So the other thing that I found out that took me a long time because it's not immediate. If you consider what we as a surgeon, I suffered when my patient had the big complication and, and th Dr. Tiswa helping me in the OR. For a year, I suffered. I could barely look at this, this guy in the eyes. But the, the value that he gave to his complication is totally different than the value I gave it to it. Ron was actually thinking only, how can I get better so I can be with my wife? And today they, they make jokes between them. Even on Facebook, there's a joke that Ron says, I gave you to his wife, I gave you your, your, uh, my liver. And the wife says, yeah, I give you part of my portal vein because I need a part of the portal vein of the wife to fix his, his portal vein. So you know what I mean? I have a donor that had a big major bile leak. It lasted for four weeks, had a drain in it. He couldn't care less. I was a frantic and said, I got the donor with complication. What, what is important for the donor is not necessarily what we think it's important from a medical point of view, or medical standard point of view. We, can, we need to think about this. I'm not saying I'm right, but just I invite you to think about this because it's an important concept. We have to value the fact that benefits for living donation are not limited to the recipient donor payer, but extend to society at large. We all pay for Medicare. The more donors, you, the more donors you do, living donors you, the more patients get transplanted. The less patients are on dialysis, the better it is for everybody. It's a fact. Okay, you don't want to talk about money. Okay, we don't talk about money, but money is part of what we do. So this is another thing. Uh, and so when you analyze, analyze all the risk and things, you have to understand that there, there are potential donors the risk, but those needs to be weighted with what is the benefit they bring about. And that is, as I said many times, to state that the risk of, uh, of that is only 0.1% does not mean discounted issue of that. I acknowledge the point. It's a possibility. But I need to put this in the right frame, in, under the right light, when I discuss things in a broader sense. Um, and I know that there is a price to pay, but there is, do we do anything without paying a price in this life? And why living donation should be such a different thing than anything else that we do in life? I, I don't know, but I, I want to raise this question. And then we have to make the donor journey easy or easier. Uh, for example, my opinion, if I were there, instead of making all this big fuss about uh, increasing the disease organ and things like that, I would go there and force the insurance company and to implement lifelong follow-up. Not only two years, lifelong. You are a donor, you're going to have lifelong follow-up. And then we will have real data and we can really make sure that our donors will do well for the rest of their life. And then, of course, I would abandon. There are, there are still insurance companies at the time they give you that. If you are a donor, they may say that's a pre-existing condition. That's absurd. And that needs to be changed. And that's where we should put our efforts to make this thing better. Um, and of course, I would do incentive donation. Absolutely. Incentivize. Incentive leave donation. Pay leave of absence. Uh, make uh, everything possible so that the donors feel comfortable. The most important thing that will donor will tell you is, I work. How can I get this time off work so I can help my husband, my wife, my, my, my child? Make rules so that that is possible that can be done properly. Well, the other thing is design intelligent regulation that will nudge transplant center to embrace living donation. We are not doing that. There was one case of transmitted hepatitis C from a living donor to, uh, to a recipient. And then all of a sudden, all the forms and things need to be updated. And it's crazy. It's, nobody would do that for one case out of a 50,000 never had that. We're changing again. We're making our job. The cost of a transplant center, I'm involved a lot with cost in my transplant center, of doing reporting and things like that is incredible. There's no other part of medicine that does that. We need to make that an easier process. And, and, and we need to nudge transplant center in understanding the value of living donation. And then I'm big in this. I really believe it. I think, I say it out loud, I know that many people don't agree with me. This is the, the, the two teams, the donor team and the recipient, it's BS. All right, it's the biggest BS ever. You know what? If the recipient has a problem and I'm the donor surgeon, I'm going to run to him to take care of him and vice versa. 
And I need to know as a donor surgeon what is going to happen to my recipient, to the recipient as well. And if you talk to the families, I never heard in so many years, oh, I want to go to a, a different doc. The most why, 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 why am not, why are you guys separated? There were rules in my hospital even when I got there that the donor is on one floor and the recipient is on another one. Why? When they go home, they're going to sleep, do sleep in separate rooms, wife and husband? I mean, come on, guys. Let, let's get logical about these things. Let's really put some sanity. This distinction was made because of a few episodes that happened. And so we, surgeons, were put under the light as the vultures that want to get the living donors done so they can increase the number of transplant performance, they can get richer. So that's what was behind this. And I refuse that because I stand up, I say I perform my profession ethically, and that's not why I'm there. So that's why I stand up against these stupid rules. <laughs> Let's talk about hepatosoral carcinoma, and then I'm going to finish this up. So you know that the way the transplant list works, HCC uh, gets points. So even if I have a well-compensated liver disease, so my cirrhosis is not that bad, and I can still go to work, and attend to my family needs. The problem is that, not the problem, I have a, a, a cancer and they get points. And it's one of the few, few things in liver transplant where every three months my points increase. So we end up transplanting uh, many, many patients who get the transplant because of the cancer, but reality, functionally, they do very well. That sorts of several you know, downstream effects, but that's really what it is. Now, in my opinion, those would be the best candidates ever to live in donation. And to give you how things are turned around by people who don't like living donation, when we started doing living donors, we were doing this on patients who had well compensated liver function because you give them half a liver, and so you want to be sure that they can tolerate half a liver instead of the entire liver. And the question was, oh, of course your results are better because you are transplanting people with, you know, not to seek uh, uh, liver condition, and you know that's why it is. Well, what is this? This, this. This is exactly the same thing. We are transplanting people who have very well preserved liver function and they have a cancer. So this is what happens. Since we implemented the HCC rule in 2002. There have been thousands of patients who have received a liver transplant for hepatosoral carcinoma. Many of these patients had a very well-preserved uh, liver function. They went on top of the list because they were accruing points every three months, and so they end up having 30, 35 points and being transplanted. So I calculated that about 7,000 patients which have been transplanted between 2000 and 2008, and I want to there was one thing that um, Mark has this line where he says, if only one in this room will donate, we will eliminate the, program, the problem of, uh, of uh, organ shortage in the United States. That's about true. One in, one, one in 100, one in 70. I said that very bravely in uh, Barcelona, Spain. Yeah. <laughs> Barely survived. Yeah, but, but that, that's what it is. Your hand go up, right? <laughs> but that's what it is. Because, of course, the, the Spanish. <laughs> so, the bottom line is that think about if even we did half of this, we live in down instead of using cadavers. We would have 3,500 cadavers liver to give to somebody else on the transplant list. That's another thing that you do with living donation. Now, everybody's got a living donor, but if you properly use both supplies, you can get much longer results and better results. So, my conclusions at the end of this. Um, we work, I, I put we because I really work hard for this, uh, to make living donations safe and we will not stop. But forget the 0% complication rate. It's not there. It ain't going to happen. So if that's your mindset, forget about living donation. Uh, we have to accept this fact if we want to reframe the way we look and we consider living donation in the realm of treatments for end stage organ disease. And the next step is to recognize that at the present time, living donation is the only solution to the supply demand impasse. Uh, and in five years, 10 years from now, we have something new, more than welcome, we'll change our practice. Today, that's, I think, really where we stand. And today, we should really change our mind, starting from a sound ethical uh, homework that I think uh, I will I explain to you, starting with the fact that clinically, the living donor is unattackable, is the best therapy out there. And starting with the fact that I think we are at a, a certain level of comfortable uh, feeling that we are doing the best of our donors. We won't give the 0%, but we're doing really a lot.
to make sure that they're safe in the process of donation. And uh, that's it. That's my daughter. If you have questions, please go ahead. So Dr. Testa, when you were talking about using live donors for the hepatocellular carcinoma, were you talking about people in the, inside the Milan criteria or outside? No, no. Those who were, most of them are people inside the Milan criteria. And so, Absolutely. And the, inside, other, and the other issue I wanted to bring up is that I've worked with the kidney donors now for two years, a little more than that. It's a completely different person that comes forward for kidneys. Um, I think in general, and I have no scientific evidence to prove this, but they're not as prepared when they come. Um, they don't put as much thought into it. And I would like to maybe propose some kind of a study to see why there's such a big difference. Because we... D liver donors. The liver donors seem to be a lot more prepared. When they come to the clinic, they've read the material. Um, they're just absolutely 100% more prepared. Um, and ready to move forward. The kidney people seem to vasculate a little bit more than the liver donor. So maybe one day we could do some sort of study regarding that. Well, I, I that think difference. there is a lot of, uh, that's an important point. I think there is a lot of perception behind it also. For some reason, people are perceive kidney donation as an easier step than living donation liver. And that the liver donation operation is uh, considered to be a more complicated, uh, upfront, riskier surgery than uh, kidney donation. It's all to be seen, in my opinion. And um, I, do, I, I and also so think that it's more sociably acceptable to give for a kidney, like give a person a kidney versus a liver, because most people think, oh, you're giving a liver, that person drank too much. And so even with some of my donors years later, they've come to me and said, well, why would you give liver to your brother-in-law who's an alcoholic? And she's like, he wasn't an alcoholic. So the perception's just, it's just a whole different, I don't want to use the word animal, but group of people giving to kidneys versus liver. But and the, I would love to study that. Someday. But that's true. The perception also, the disease is important. I mean, uh, liver is not sellable. It's not something that you can sell very well. Uh, because most of our patients have hepatitis C and you usually don't get it unless you are looking for it. Uh, alcohol, uh, same thing. So it's difficult to... Um, to accept from that point of view. Although you know better than I do how many daughters or wife or, or cousins step forward to donate to people who are alcoholic. Uh, so. Sure, sure. Yep. Um, Giuliani, thank you. I, I really love your project and I would really <laughs> encourage you to go forward as strongly as possible. But that whole concept of double equipoise, I, I just don't personally understand how you can use this and maybe you don't want to, doesn't your project have to lean on some other rationale for its going forward than that particular concept? Since the, you'll never have that zero level, at least on the basis of medical criteria, for your donors. Yeah, but if, if the concept when was constructed and thought about had been uh, that's possible only on the zero percent premise, then, of course, then falls, the, but, the argument is stop up front. But then it's not equipoise anymore. No, it's something else. That, but that's right. the, the, so you, the concept that works as, with a certain amount of acceptable risks. Now, uh, maybe you can't do it, but another possibility would be to expand the concept of equipoise so that it encompasses more than medical criteria. True. That, that would be intriguing. So, you know, Giuliano, I mean, one of the things that I think is a problem is that people are either lumped into the pro or con living donor camp. And you've said that at least three times during the, during the lecture. And I would invite you to look at it a different way. The, the lecture you gave hasn't really changed in a decade. And we've been doing this for more, you know, I've been doing it as long as you've been doing it. And as a society, as a group of people, we haven't really developed a database or any kind of interactive thing to even estimate what we know. We know that for your 3,500 that at least 18 people would have died to achieve that goal. And who knows how many more 
would have needed an emergency liver transplant. Because in the United States, we don't even have a database that can rapidly tell us those kind of numbers. And we still quibble about what the actual incidence is. My question is, are we really in a spot where we've responsibly utilized that metric? And maybe for people who think we could be doing it better, that may be a little bit of the opposition. For suicides alone, the University of Minnesota in a paper in transplantation showed that the incidence of suicide is three times higher for an age, sex, and um, race um, matched control. So there are problems, but I would argue that we as a group as surgeons haven't really addressed them in a way that, for example, aviation has. And that may be holding us back. I don't know. I go back to what I said before. I said uh, uh, the correlation is not causation. And if there is a three time increase in the match population of suicide, I would argue that probably those people should not be done up front. And if you really want to do this in an analytical fashion, that you see how many had depression at the time of donation and never committed suicide. So, again, my point is that we can discuss the numbers, we can discuss anything that we want, but there is a perception out there that I think needs to be uh, somewhat. Uh, not changed, but at least made people more aware of the value of living donation. And honestly, you know, at the end of the day, the public will determine that. And the public where I, the, where I work is telling me that they want living donors. They want to have a living donors. And so to discount that up front because we know better, I think it's the wrong approach. Well, because the approach, yeah, exactly. If you. And what are we doing? How many campaigns have you seen we properly highlight the benefit of living donation? Never one was done because we always feel like it's soliciting for something. I'm sorry. We got we to gotta be honest about this. We, yes. We can't even figure out the number. We don't even know the number. The number is well, I can tell you that in a year and a half I've been a bailor. I had 180 requests for living donation. 180. That's public to me. There is the H2O study, there is the SCRTR. How many other agencies you want to have there to do the same thing over and over? None of those emergency, you know, well, we don't know anything. You know, at least seven people have been done, and none of them are reported. They're written up. One of them is written up. No, they're more, they're more than that. The one in Scotland is written up, the one in uh, Philadelphia has been written up. So people are out there. If you go to the conference like I do, you talk, you know these things. So, just on this point about the suicides, you, what, the point you were just arguing that correlation isn't causation, right? But one of, your, one of the points that you were advocating was actually, what I, if I heard correctly, was to remove the, the heightened screening for psychiatric and psychological issues. So, I mean, what happens if you get a spike in this? You know, what if people, by the virtue of donating, I mean, I can imagine the pathway, that they are trying to relieve some inner turmoil and they feel like, you know, this, this gift that they're going to give somehow reconciles it. And, and then it doesn't end up doing that because these issues are complex. So how are you going to bring those two priorities together where you want to examine these issues on the one hand but retain the safety perhaps that you have right now? Maybe eight was actually a lower number than what would have happened if the screening wasn't there. Right. And I think you have a very valid point. But my point is never to make the, I think, as I said at the end, that we, we got to a point where our evaluation process is a sound process. I really want to defend that. I think we're doing a good job at doing these things. What I'm trying to say is that you can't continue to question tremendous this, a mental sanity of the donor in the way that we're doing. That was mainly the point that I made. And the fact that I advocate for a lifelong follow-up on these people is exactly because of this. Because if you can really convince people that it's good for society at large, then you have to force society to take care of those donors for the rest of their life, not for one or two years follow up like we do nowadays with few labs that come to the office and that's all you know. So there's got to be a system in place. That's what I try to say. Nudge a transplant center to put a system in place where we value living donation in the way it's supposed to be done. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry I didn't loan you my favorite slide, which, which would have um, 
advanced your argument, uh, not, not the one about number of living donors going through the roof, but my favorite slide is a, a slide of Sox Park, and, and a baseball game is being played, and, and there's a batter in the batter's box, and the rest of the park is filled. It must have been a playoff game, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, and, and there were 30,000 people in the stands, and, and the batter in the batter's box. If the batter in the batter's box represents whatever, the 12,000 living um, or deceased donors in the United States, let's say for kidneys each year, then the rest of the stands, the other 30,000, represent the potential living donors. So you, you've got this, you know, this one unit in the batter's box, and then you've got the rest of the stands. So it's a huge denominator from which you could potentially be drawing. Uh, the fact that, as you showed and everybody else has showed, John made the point, um, the number of living donors is, has been on the decline uh, dramatically for livers and um, less so for kidneys, um, suggests that this huge untapped pool of millions upon millions of people are, 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 not, are, are not participating. Um, now, I'm, I'm not saying it's going to be an easy task to, to recruit them, but um, I think Giuliano's provocative talk um, offers a, 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 an approach. Uh, what's, what's the difference, provocative and? Outrageous. No, but you didn't say it. Did you? Uh, if there are no more comments, I would like you to join me in thanking Giuliano. Thank you.